Welcome. Uh, I'm Behruz Kamari. I'm the director of um, Charmin and uh, Bijan Musawar Rahmani Center for Iran and Persian Gulf Studies. Um, and uh, today, unfortunately, we couldn't control the weather today. Suddenly, it started raining and hopefully more people would join us. But meanwhile, as you're enjoying your lunch, uh, let me introduce our uh, <clears throat> Uh, speaker, um, Dr. Golbag Rekab Talai, who uh, is an assistant professor of um, history at Seton Hall University uh, in our own neighborhood. <clears throat> uh, professor Rekab Talai is a graduate uh, of history department at University of Toronto uh, in recent years. Uh, I should admit that the University of Toronto has uh, produced uh, perhaps the most vibrant and in intellectually interesting um, um, uh, scholars of um, uh, Iranian studies, and, uh, and Professor Rekab is one of them. Um, she is uh, primarily a uh, scholar of uh, Iranian cultural history, uh, but she also uh, thinks and writes and speaks about processes of urbanization in 20th century Iran and uh, cultural changes and, um, and uh, these different competing processes of modernity that, that uh, produced a, a very distinct and interesting notion of cosmopolitanism. Uh, and, uh, and her book... Um, called Iranian Cosmopolitanism, a Cinematic History, uh, uh, which uh, is hot out of the press uh, in 20, 2019, Cambridge University Press, uh, uh, is also an, a testament, first uh, on, on the uh, uh, quite uh, sophisticated analysis of uh, Iranian cultural history, and also, uh, and, uh, and to me at least more, Importantly, uh, the way she looks at the notion of cosmopolitanism outside this kind of binary understandings of local Western cultures and, and how the, these are processes that are co-constitutive of uh, one another <clears throat> through the cinematic uh, lens. And, um, and I highly recommend uh, uh, the book. Uh, it's one of the really important books, and, and I think that it establishes uh, Professor Rekab Talai as really one of the uh, emerging, most important emerging uh, scholars of uh, modern uh, Iran. <clears throat> um, uh, she's been here in New Jersey for uh, uh, two years now, uh, and, uh, and I know most Americans are thinking of moving up to Canada, but this is sort of the, <laughs> the, the, the opposite direction that we do attract some uh, uh, Canadian scholars uh, to our midst. Um, uh, I also uh, want to mention uh, that uh, uh, October is a very busy month uh, for us. Uh, and, uh, and whenever I say busy month, I had to mention uh, uh, our uh, colleague uh, Becky Parnian, who's sitting right there in the corner, and uh, busy months means uh, a lot of work for her, and and uh, and a lot of these gatherings uh, that we enjoy and we come and and uh, and listen and learn and and leave uh, are made possible uh, by uh, her uh, um, tireless work. <clears throat> We have uh, two other events that I uh, really want you to pay attention to on, on uh, uh, October 18, Friday evening. We have an amazing piano recital uh, by Leila Ramazan, who's uh, uh, yeah, traveling here from Switzerland uh, and, uh, and is open to public. Uh, and, um, and the password is Iran Center. When you arrive, just say Iran Center, you're going to get no, there is no password. <laughs> and, um, and also next week, we are starting uh, a new series in our program, a book launch series that uh, we are starting this new series with uh, 
and uh, I guess Pajol Lee's uh, new book uh, on, um, on uh, reframing Iran. This is a fascinating work, ethnography of uh, Iranian uh, revolutionary guards, cultural production. Uh, in uh, uh, and I and the event is going to be at the Labyrinth uh, Book uh, Store uh, next Wednesday at six o'clock in the uh, evening. So, without further ado, uh, welcome uh, Professor Rekab Talai and. Uh, Thank you so much. Um, let me take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Ramari Tabrizi for his very kind and generous uh, introduction. Um, and also to give my thanks to um, the uh, Mosavva Rahmani Center for Iran and Persian Gulf Studies for the invitation. And also um, uh, to Ms. Parnian for coordinating the event. And also thank you for joining us on this very rainy <laughs> uh, day. <coughs> and please let me know if my voice is too loud with this. <laughs> In a 1924 article titled, The Country Has Become Francotopic, Mamlekat Farangistan Shode, Nahid Priyadako, surveyed a range of developments in the city that did not exist in Tehran a few years back. These new developments included electric lights, beautiful shops, chic hairdressing salons, music and orchestra at the upper levels of the Grand Hotel, the scenery of Armenian and European women with appealing clothes, Muslim and European men scented with fokol or bow tie and ties, the passing and fleeting of cars with the speed of electricity, the, fl the flying of airplanes in the skies of Tehran, and so on. The article then remarked with sarcasm that our own Karbalais, a title given to those who make a pilgrimage to the city of uh, Karbala in Iraq, see such novelties and tell one another the world has rotten and the country has become francotopic altogether, francotopic or like the Occident. I think this quote very well captures the spirit of drastic changes and intercultural exchanges experienced in Tehran in the first two decades of the 20th century. In my book, Iranian Cosmopolitanism, a Cinematic History, I explore the shaping of a cosmopolitan society in Tehran enabled through cultural exchanges between Iran and the world. Examining Iranian cultural and social history from 1900 to 1979, I demonstrate that physical and imaginative interactions between diverse populations in cinema shaped a vernacular cosmopolitan culture that came to bear upon uh, filmmaking in Iran. <clears throat> I trace the transformations of cosmopolitanism by examining the space of cinema, the cinematic image, and the culture surrounding this medium from 1900 to 1979. Investigating various artistic movements, I argue that cosmopolitanism was, in fact, a style of national imagination for much of the 20th century. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on the first few chapters of my books, uh, specifically the first two chapters of my book, because this is a period uh, in the history of Iranian cinema that's usually neglected in the literature. An empire at the turn of the 20th century, Iran was already home to various ethnic, religious, and linguistic groups. Towards the end of the 19th and early 20th century, more and more war-ridden neighboring communities chose Iran as their new national home, while a large number of Iranian merchants, political figures, students, journalists, and workers also traveled back and forth to the neighboring regions and beyond. Many members of ethnic, religious, and linguistic groups such as Armenian, Azerbaijani, Georgian, and Russian communities, along with Indian, American, French, German, and British, who settled in Tehran, conceived the growing urban center as either a safe haven from socio-political pressures that had compelled them to migrate, or as a suitable center for cultural and commercial activities, 
or alternatively, as has been argued, for actualization of imperialist uh, aspirations. Nevertheless, the increased assembly and interaction of people of different backgrounds in Tehran turned the city into a diasporic hub of highly diverse national, ethnic, religious, and linguistic communities. These diasporic groups had also diverse urban middle class habits, which included a vigorous engagement with newspapers, photography, theater, music gatherings, conferences, charity events, uh, societal customs that further contributed to uh, cultural heterogeneity uh, at the turn of the century. So the transnational flow and congregation of these communities in Tehran necessitated the formation and propagation of new spaces for entertainment, education, and everyday needs of these groups, which were in fact a lot of times also owned or operated uh, by the members of the same communities. For example, many educational institutions were founded uh, to meet the demands of a changing society. New hotels, coffee shops, reading rooms, and stores were established to cater to the urban population. In terms of public performances, the number of theatrical spectacles and plays performed by the residents and international artists who toured and performed in the country also grew significantly. Um, to just give you a few examples, the theatrical play Three Fiancés and One Bride by the Armenian actor and director Musio Gustanian and Madame Gol Sabah, uh, the historical Eastern dance piece of Kei Khosro uh, about the moral grandeur and power of ancient Persia, as was um, uh, advertised in the announcements, um, conducted by, in fact, <clears throat> excuse me, conducted by a famous Russian ba ballet dancer and four European women, and the historically important piece of Nader Shah of Afshar, conducted under the supervision of uh, Ghulam Reza Sharif Sadeh, um, the, the head of the Republic of Azerbaijan State Theater, are among some of the performances that were staged in that era. Many of these theatrical performances were co-productions between Iranians and diasporic uh, communities. And to give you one specific example, the uh, spectacle of Ferdowsi uh, was sponsored by the American School of Higher Education, and it was performed by most famous Iranian actors and included Caucasian and European music with Iranian anthems. So it can be imagined how the advertisement for such performances could appeal to the diverse communities who lived in Iran. So it was within such uh, urban transformations that cinema was introduced in the 1900s, and a culture of movie going began to emerge. Many of the first cinematograph operators were members of ethnic Armenian, Russian, Georgian, Azerbaijani, and Azerbaijani communities who began to project films in their coffee shops, antique stores, hotels, and other public sites of sociability. To name a few, Rusi Khan, an immigrant under Russian patronage, also known as Mehdi Ivanov, was a photographer who later opened and operated a number of movie theaters around the city, with the first one, in fact, being in his photography studio. The Armenian merchant Ardashis Badmagarian, or uh, also known as Ardashir Khan, established a number of venues for the screening of films and was especially influential in creating a culture of movie going. Um, Agayov, a merchant and coffee shop owner of Azeri descent, uh, as well as Antoine Sevregin, the famous Armenian Georgian photographer, were among the people who also opened a number of movie theaters in the 19 teens. This was, of course, in addition to cosmopolitan Iranians who projected films in the space of their shops. Mirza Ibrahim Khan Sahaf Fashi, for example, was one of the first Iranian merchants and political activist who had seen cinematograph screenings abroad and imported the cinematograph device to Iran and made use of it as a commercial enterprise in his antique shop in as early as 1903. And um, the cinematograph device that um, a lot of these uh, advertisements refer to was basically this device that both projected and recorded film, um, but basically they use the same um, name for, for cinema in general. So whenever I say cinematograph, I'm basically referring to film screenings and, um, and cinema. 
Some of the memoirs from this era attend to the activities in these new spaces and register people's reactions to this novel experience. Sahaf Bashi's cinema, according to the memoirs of Ghulam, uh, Ghulam Ali Khan Aziz al-Sultan, Ghulam Ali Khan Aziz al-Sultan, a gesture of the Qajar court, hosted foreigners on Sunday mornings and the public on Sunday evenings, alluding to the notion that the Tehrani public attended motion picture screenings. In his memoirs of 1909, Qahraman Mirza Ainul Sartane, Il Qajar Prince, stated that Cinematograph, the cinematograph had evolved since the last time he had seen it, and that people went to the cinema in crowds from dusk to dawn. In his memoir of the same year, he especially expressed his feelings towards the technology when he wrote that cinematograph is truly spectacular and it is a good industry. So these are important because uh, much of the literature actually mentions that uh, cinema was not uh, popular in the first uh, few decades that um, it, it began functioning or, or it was launched in, in uh, Iran. According to the same memoir uh, by Qahraman Mirza Ainul Satane, Rusi Khan's movie theater on the second level of Faru's printing house where ice cream, fruit, and beer were served despite the expensiveness of beer, they have become known as the court of bow-tie clad dandies, or uh, Darbar Fokoliha. In 1908, another Qajar prince, Amadou Sartane Salur, wrote that he went to a cinematograph screening the night before. The venue showed meaningless films, including an assembly of people from Tabriz um, in the military training field. The memoir then describes Amadou Sartane Salur's discontent with strange circumstances of the time, since according to him, the Shiite clerics of Najaf, uh, uh, Shiite holy city in Iraq, do not contest the unveiling of women, the selling of alcoholic drinks, and the opening of several motels that allow for the consumption of alcohol during the day in, in the open. Apparently, he said, Tehran has been liberated. From the beginning, many of the motion pictures screened in movie theaters or informal movie gatherings were in fact short or feature films imported from countries such as France, Russia, Azerbaijan, India, Germany, United States, Italy, and they also included Arabic speaking films. Before the 1920s, Iranians had not produced any short and feature films for public screening. So until then, International newsreels and short and feature films compensated for a national cinema and provided a cultural means for national imagination. Early short motion pictures made in the Russian Empire, comedies in Turkish language, most likely imported from Azerbaijan, uh, newsreels about the First World War, um, mainly distributed by, uh, by the British, also Russia and France, Italian and French comedies and dramas, and the American film, The Count of uh, Monte Cristo, were among some of the popular films that acted as mediators between competing con uh, conceptions of the global for Iranian local audiences. In fact, the international war newsreels pertaining to the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905 and First World War became raging topics in cinemas and were sources of commercial profit for cinematograph owners. Scholars of modern Iran um, have almost unanimously neglected an analysis of international war newsreels because of their colonial, imperialist, and propagandist um, agendas. The abundance of war newsreels in cinema programs, however, leaves no doubt that these films were popular and well received by audiences in cities such as Tehran. In some film programs, these war newsreels were in fact combined with comedies and drama short films which appealed to the general public. One could even argue that the popularity of the Russo-Japanese war films was premised on a sense of hope raised among Iranians of diverse backgrounds that the Japanese triumph over the Russians marked the triumph of a developing nation over an imperial force. Sentiments that were also reflected in newspaper articles, essays, and conference programs at the time. 
Pate Cinema Institution had in fact distributed the Russo-Japanese war film with two titles, one being Long Live Russia and the other being Long Live Japan, which as sources show us were alternately selected by cinema owners to interchangeably play to the varied sentiments of audiences. The temporal co correlation of the screening of the Russo-Japanese war films with the onset of the Constitutional Revolution in 1906, from 1906 to 1911, should not be overlooked. The Russo-Japanese war as a global event projected on Iranian cinema screens became the future past of Iran in 1906, in that war against an imperial power captured in moving images provided a horizon of expectation for Iranians during the Constitutional Revolution, a revolution that um, aimed to limit the power of the imperial monarchy and also to uh, limit uh, colonial interference. Moreover, war newsreels and films arguably transported the diverse residents of Iran to international war fronts or battlefields, and some to homelands, um, because a lot of these were, you know, people were coming from other uh, parts of the world. And more significantly, these films position people as contemporaneous participants of the 20th century. In the absence of national films, images of progress and scientific advancement featured in international films, as well as scenes of devastation and war-torn cities, worked to envisage and evoke an imagination of what Iran's future ought to be, advanced, sovereign, and war-free, and also socially moral. The Iranian modern subjectivity was shaped through the negotiations that occurred through cinematic experiences, either in accepting or rejecting globally informed narratives, on, or receiving these narratives through multiple and hybrid experiences facilitated in this new space. So unlike what has been usually argued, in the absence of a central, centralized state uh, or a national cinema from 1900s to 1930s, Iran's hybrid residents who were cognizant of and in dialogue with global trends were successful in legitimizing and popularizing cinema at a time of precarity. Cosmopolitan merchants and film projectionists aligned their missions with popular nationalist discourses of the time and not, maybe not necessarily for ideological reasons, but at least to receive a high return on ticket sales. They designed film programs, announcements, and posters in a way that promoted cinema as a means for the governance of selfhood a or a medium for the moral enlightenment of the masses in the service of national progress. Film screenings were included in school and conference programs, and masses were encouraged uh, to attend moral and scientific film screenings. So for example, in a 1919 film announcement from Rad newspaper, Palace Cinema specifically claimed the purpose of cinema to be for the rectification of public morale. As such, discounted tickets were made available to students by various movie theaters in Tehran and other cities as well. Um, another example, in 1915, uh, New Cinema, allocated 200 free tickets for the students in Tehran to watch a film that was of such importance that it was intended to be the only film um, in the program for that night. After Reza Shah came to power in 1925, cinema gained an even more prominent role, especially in the fields of politics and education. Realizing the potential of cinema as an extension of technologies of power, the Pahlavi government institutionalized cinema, thereby morphing it into a status discipline, disciplinary tool that served the government's nationalist agenda in the 1930s. In other words, the Pahlavi state took over a project that had begun by merchants and cultural trendsetters, trendsetters before him. Government officials, such as, such as the chairman of the National Police in 1933, described cinema as a crucial cornerstone for the changing of social mentality and uplifting in addition to representing the national progress of any state. According to the chairman, 
cinema could introduce the masses to, necessary, to the necessary principles and direct the attention of foreign spectators to industrial and social advancements in the country. In that light, a code of film recording and cinema screening was established in 1930 by the Ministry of Interior, and other governmental institutions began to promote the employment of films at all levels of education. So it was during this time that first, the first Iranian uh, feature films were produced. Amidst the heightening of nationalist sentiments and uh, ambitions for national and, and uh, economic sovereignty in, in the 1920s, social critics, journalists, and cinema enthusiasts began, began calls for the establishment of cinematic sovereignty, or basically for the creation of a national cinema, which to them basically meant a Persian language cinema. Such aspirations actualized in the first Persian language silent films of the late 1920s made by hybrid citizens and cosmopolitan trendsetters who had already laid the foundation uh, for a movie-going culture in the first two decades of the, the century. The activities of these people led to the creation of a cinema that I call a cosmonational cinema. Um, uh, I call these Persian language silent films because the intertitles of the films were of course in in persian language along with other languages as well in 1930 the first training center for cinema acting in tehran was established by a russian armenian emigre ovanes ohanians in the same year with the acting of his first group of students and the help of Khan Baba Mu'tazedi, who was himself a, camera, uh, a filmmaker and cameraman, Ohanians directed the first silent feature film in Iran by the title of Abi and Rabi. Unfortunately, we don't have a copy of the film. Ohanians, who had studied film in Russia, attempted to bring fruition to his studies by opening his own actor training studio in Tehran. The training center included a plethora of activities ranging from music, acting, gymnastics, dance, acrobatics, filming, and athletics. A variety of activities that also resembled the curriculum of Russian film schools. Khan Baba Mu'tazadi, the cameraman of the film, himself had acquired most of his film training in Paris, where he found a job at the Gaumont uh, Film Company through befriending the son of the Gaumont com uh, Company, uh, the owner of the company. When, when coming back to Iran, the owner of the company presented uh, Mu'tazadi with a fully equipped filming device, a projector for the screening of films, the special chemical for the development of films, and a large amount of film stock, which he would later use to make a few newsreels. In 1933, Ovanes Ohanians produced his second uh, silent film, Hajiaga Aktora Sinema, or Mr. Haji, the cinema actor. Praised by a film review in Iran newspaper as the first elaborate movie that has been filmed entirely in Tehran and with the participation of Iranian actors, the first production of Ohanian's purse from company, Haji Agha, was considered as a familiar Khodamani film in the fir its, its first screening uh, on 31st January of 1934. The intertitles of the film were prepared in the three languages of Persian, French, and Russian, as you can see in this example, pointing to two languages other than Persian that were perhaps the most comprehensible by residents of urban centers, reflecting the social hybridity within which films were received during this time. In the film, Haji Agha, a traditional man with religious attributes, has an unfavorable view towards cinema. Unbeknownst to him, however, his daughter, in addition to his son-in-law, Parviz, and his servant, Puri, are all members of a cinema acting institution, one that was very similar to Ohanian's own training center. The director of the institution, a worldly um, bow-tie-wearing uh, flaneur, played by Ohanian himself, uh, is searching for an in interesting topic for a film. Parviz, uh, the uh, fiancé of Haji Agha's daughter, 
A progressive and open-minded man who, unlike Haji Agha, wears European-style suits, as opposed to the Iranian traditional male outfits, suddenly comes up with the idea of filming Haji Agha surreptitiously, and later showing him the film to perhaps change his opinion um, towards cinema. To this end, Puri, the servant, snatches Haji Agha's watch, which makes the subject furious enough to run after him. The director then shoots the chase, the spectacle of which involves numerous comic, carnivalesque, and surreal scenes. Um, I'm going to show you a scene from, um, uh, actually, uh, maybe first I'll talk about this film. Some of these um, scenes that uh, you know, were talked about in newspaper articles were, for example, this scene where one of the actors is jumping from the third level of, uh, of uh, uh, Café Pars uh, in Tehran. This is it, and that's the guy jumping um, from that level, and this was apparently uh, because of the training they got through the training center uh, in gymnastics and ac acrobatics. <laughs> Um, and in this, in this clip, this is part of the chase um, of Haji Agha after uh, Puri. Um, and uh, here, the, the person who had snatched the, the watch is uh, trying to cross the street. And this is the artillery square in Tehran. Um, and um, it's interesting because as he tries to cross the street, it, I think the film also is trying to show the um, how unfamiliar he is with the, these changes that are occurring in Tehran. Uh, for example, automobiles in Tehran streets. So all of a sudden, in the middle of the street, he sits on the automobile. Without, you know, paying attention. <laughs> so in a way, the film is also a critique of, you know, these rapid uh, modernization um, trends that are happening in, uh, in Tehran and urbanization that are happening in Tehran. The chase itself, and this scene is also very reminiscent of Buster, uh, Buster Keaton uh, films, uh, which is in itself also interesting. At the end of the film, the director projects the film for Haji Agha, who then, astonished by the spectacle and the familiarity of the images, changes his mind towards cinema therefore allowing his daughter and son-in-law to continue their activities at the institution. So in, in depicting the dialogism between the old and new, conservative and open-minded ideologies, cosmopolitan and local, changing and stagnant, modern, bow-tie-wearing and locally-dressed residents, the basic plot of the film very well demonstrates the changing vernacular practices and contestations that define the ethos of modernity in Iran. And you can see that in some of these film stills, where they're trying to um, uh, draw attention to the contrast between people um, on the streets of Tehran. Like the social hybridity that it drew from in its making, the film to borrow from Bakhtin is a polyphonous construct, like an immense novel, multi-generic, multi-styled, mercilessly critical, soberly mocking, reflecting in all its fullness the heteroglossia and multiple voices of a given culture, people, and epoch. Filmed by a Russian emigre, George Pavlov Potemkin, uh, with its photography carried out by a person named Rambrandt. <laughs> Casting Iranian and uh, Iranian Armenian actors and based on everyday Iranian life, Mr. Haji, the cinema actor, was a modern cosmopolitan flick, yet one that reflected an emergent national cinema. Ohanians had elaborate plans for the making of a national cinema in Iran. In fact, in 1934, he submitted a proposal for a cinema project to Iran a newspaper, according to which he saw the creation of films in Iran necessary. Locally produced films that included beautiful sceneries and were cheap in production would generate not only monetary return, but also moral profit especially since, according to him, these films would be produced under right conditions and would be devoid of aspects that were against morality. And he's talking about international films here. 
Some of the obje uh, subjects that Ohanian's recommended for filmmaking in Iran included the life of Hakim Omar Khayyam, um, a famous poet, the 1921 coup d'etat of uh, Reza Khan, Tehran's daughter, Ferdowsi's life, uh, Rostam and Sohrab, Shah Abbas, Khosro and Shirin, and stories relating to the time of Nader Shah, Shah of Afshar. Many of the themes and stories that Ohanians referred to in his proposal, in fact, became the main plot of feature films that were produced later on in the years that followed, except not by Ohanians himself. So around the same time in the 1930s, Imperial, the Imperial Film Company of Bombay took on the task of producing Persian language talkies. The first one of which was The Lore Girl, or Dokhtare Lore, released in the late 1933. Fully shot in India, The Lore Girl was directed by Khan Bahadur Ardar Shir Khan Irani, an Indian of the Parsi community, also known as the father of talky films in India. The film was based on a screenplay written by Abdul Hussein Sepanta, an Iranian poet and researcher who had an avid interest in ancient Persian literature and history. In Iran, the film was in fact advertised with the alternative title, Iran of Yesterday and Iran of Today, as a production of a Persian film co filming company in Imperial Film Company of Bombay. And of course, that didn't exist. Um, and it included the participation of Iranian artists. The announcement invited people to observe and compare the conditions of old Iran and the rapid advancement of Iran under the rule of the just and mighty Shah, Reza Shah. The Lurger was uh, screened in Iran both it, and India uh, in November of 1933 and was a success in both countries, mostly in Iran. Believing the biggest propaganda both inside and outside Iran to be executed by films, Iran Bostan newspaper, a semi-fascist newspaper, expressed delight in the launching of talkie films in the Persian language and commented on nationalist sentiments aroused by them. The street is full of people. People have rushed to Cinema Mayak and want to enter and buy tickets, but there is no way. Dinyar Mazdisna, um, so wrote in a review of The Lore Girl in 1933 in Iran Bostan. The theater is suddenly darkened. Khan Bahadur Ardashir Irani gives a speech. How serene and yet how exciting. The audience gives a round, sorry, gives a big round of applause. The film is about Golnar, a lore woman from the province of Khuzestan, who uh, from uh, southwestern parts of Iran, who after the mo uh, murder of her parents is abduct uh, abducted by uh, Quli Khan, the great Khan of Lore bandits. Golnar, who works, dances, and collects money in a tea house owned by Quli Khan, meets and falls in love with Jafar, a government official, who promises to take Golnar to Tehran and away from her abductors. Once he had, but once he's finished with his mission. Oli Khan, however, sets out to kill Jafar and the rest of the caravan with which he traveled. As a result of the attack, Jafar is left severely wounded. Golnar, who finds Jafar, dresses his wounds, but he, she and Jafar are both lo uh, soon located by members of the bandit. Oli Khan, therefore, imprisons both Jafar and Golnar. After a while, Quli Khan asks Jafar to work with him as a bandit. He promises that in return for his services, Jafar could take Golnar with him away from um, the bandits. Jafar, however, sees the offer as a betrayal to his country and therefore refuses the offer. Meanwhile, Golnar is able to escape and she also sets Jafar free. So withstanding many hardships on the way, Jafar and Golnar leave Iran of the Qajar period and sail on a ship to Bombay in search of a safe haven. <clears throat> After a couple of years in Bombay, Jafar suddenly receives some newspapers from Iran in which he reads about the advancements and changes that have taken place in Iran in the past few years during the Pahlavi era. 
Believing that he can now be of service to his country, Jafar and Gulnar decide to return to the new Iran. It was at this point in the film that, according to a film review, patriots applauded, cheered, and whistled out of joy to an extent that one felt the floor of the theater tremble as if, and as if the ceiling was about to collapse. According to the film report, those who had watched the film had become aware of the nationalist or patriotic sentiments of the producers and the bright flame that was burning in their hearts due to their love for the country. Considering the success of The Lore Girl on its first screening, the film criti critic of uh, Iran newspaper encouraged the Indian institution to produce more Persian films with the same level of seriousness. While Iran Boston newspaper hoped that the heroic and national stories of Shahnameh and the history of Iran would be filmed and screened by Imperial Film Company of Bombay, an endeavor that actually, in fact, was undertaken by the same company. Interestingly, The Lore Girl includes a section at the beginning of the film which elucidates the temporal and spatial context of the film. Uh, the, the intertitles reads, before the jubilant Pahlavi era, when regions in the south and west of Iran were under the influence of various tribes and nomads, statements that were featured to pay tribute to the Pahlavi government of the time. Um, I'm going to show you a clip um, of the last scenes of the film. Um, it, this is after um, the, the Rajar monarchy has been, uh, monarch has been toppled and Reza Shah has come to power and of course Iran has had all these advancements and uh, pro has progressed. Um, and you can see that at the end of the film, this is while uh, Jafar and Golnar are still in, in India and uh, Jafar has read newspapers uh, that talk about the advancements during the time of um, uh, Reza Shah. Thank you. 
So in fact, the Iranian government endorsed Sepanta as a pivotal figure in Persian language film industry and commissioned him and the same Indian company to make other Persian language films. Because of these reasons, in the literature on the history of Iranian cinema, The Lore Girl has received attention as a national film produced by Iranian natives. A lot of times, Abdul Hussein Sepanto has been identified and acclaimed as the director of the film, perhaps as part of a retrospective agenda to claim the film as an Iranian production made by an Iranian director and revolving around a very strictly patriotic storyline. This is why in the original film announcements and reviews of The Lore Girl, Sepanto's name is absent, as you could see in this, in these, An article in Iran, Iran Bostan, interestingly, considered Imperial Film Company of Bombay to be an Iranian institution that was run under the supervision and competence of Iranians, even though um, Khan Bahadur Ardashir Irani, the, the owner and manager of the institution and the director of the film, was an Indian of Parsi religion, of course, with ties to, to, to Iran. The reviewer attempted to appropriate the undertaking of the Indian production by attributing the Shir Khan's interest in the making of Persian films, and excluding Sepanto's name here, to his mental and spiritual connection to the fundaments of Iranian patriotism. Another Iranian cosmopolitan who had been active during this time in the field of, field of filmmaking was Ibrahim Moradi, who by the 1930s had already made some films in the northern province of Gilan. In 1917, Ibrahim Moradi uh, left Iran with his family for Russia, where he acquired skills, the skills for still photography, and where he also purchased a cinematograph de device, with which he then made some amateur films. Upon his return to Iran, Moradi established Jahan Nama Film Studio in 1929 and bought a camera from the German Zeiss company. In 1931, he then wrote the screenplay for his first film, Brothers' Revenge, Antagam Barodar, which was then shot and screened in uh, Bandar Pahlavi. Shortly after the screening of Mr. Haji, uh, the cinema actor, the film that we watched before this last one, Moradi projected his second film, The Capricious, in Tehran's cinemas. Upon the screening of the film in Tehran, The Capricious, Ohanians, the Armenian director I talked about, published a very positive review in a Talad newspaper. He wrote, I am so emotionally invested in, uh, in regard to the aforementioned film, Bol uh, Bolhavas or the Capricious, that I cannot keep myself from writing the following lines. He then summarized the reasons for his feelings as follows. First, anything that is related to filming in Iran is close to my heart, especially since I have endured much in this path and have tried to provide my services as much as possible. And therefore, he kind of um, demonstrates his national aspiration for Iranian productions. Second, what greater joy to see that Mr. Qutbi, Dehran, Gurji, and Ashti, all of whom have been my students and for whom I have so much love, have acted with such natural talent and innate intelligence. And third, that this film has been made with no foreign financial help and only with the intellectual, financial, and potential strength of the personnel of the young Iranian cinema. Such an endeavor, Ohanians believed, pro proves in absolute terms that Iranians too can participate in European industries and with their natural endowment succeed in the film, in the field. Highlighting his hyphenated identity as an Armenian Iranian, Ohanians clearly expressed his desire and hope for the establishment of a sovereign Iranian cinema industry. Early announcements of the Capricious in Iran and Boston uh, uh, newspaper, in fact, regarded the film as the first Iranian drama with professional Iranian actors. 
Another announcement in the same newspaper considered it as the only film that had, be, had been directed by an Iranian director with the participation of Iranian actors and made within Iran. So completely forgetting the, uh, overlooking the films that were made by Ohanians. And he also mentioned that the watching of this film, The Capricious, um, would bring joy to any nationalist uh, or, or patriot. Advertisements in Iran, in Iran newspaper highlighted the film's depiction of natural scenery, historical sites, and old buildings of Iran, as well as the norms and customs of res residents in north of Iran um, as being um, you know, aspects that kind of contributed to this uh, patriotic feelings that were um, aroused uh, through the film. Such nationalist remarks worked to discredit the considerable acti uh, activities of non-native citizens in a national industry. They, however, did not stop extra-national films from being produced. The corpus of films pro uh, produced from 1930 to 1936 has been usually categorized as a national or nationalist, mostly in light of the film's emergence in an era of heightened nationalist discourse. What we have here, however, is the formation of a cosmo-national cinema, national to the extent that it lent legitimacy to a shared historical era, contributed to the creation of a grand Persian culture and literature, and, adva and, and advanced and safe no uh, nation against the backdrop of world wars and culture, sorry, world wars and geopolitical strife. One of the concerns of the nationalist narrative of the time seems to have been the staging of Iran, not in the Orientalist depictions that had been widespread in the early 20th century, but as a progressive country contemporaneous with its European counterparts. For example, in a film review of Shirin and Farhad in Iran newspaper, Mir Hossein Shabohang did not express a favorable view towards the motion picture. Shabahang was specifically worried that the film converged with national history of Iran, and therefore its distribution, the distribution of this bad and disdainful movie would dishonor the reputation of the country on an international level. The facade of the buildings, except for a few exceptions, the author believed resembled that of Arab and Indian um, buildings, while the makeup of the actors made it difficult to discern the era and place of the plot. Shabahang further blamed the screenwriter for making the characters unconvincing. Overall, the critic believed the production um, to have done disservice to the history of the Sasanian uh, Empire and the love story of Farhad and Shirin, and as such deemed it necessary for the authorities to prevent the distribution of the film outside Iran. The cinematic nationalist narrative of the time, in fact, does not necessarily speak against Hollywood or other dominant European cinemas. What were at stake, however, were Persian customs or cultural mores that the Iranian elite saw as essential for a national cinema. Film critics increasingly expressed their enthusiasm about and concerns uh, with the Iranianness of these films most importantly manifested in the language of the films rather than the country of origin. The Persian language became a fundamental signifier of the nationality of these films. The cosmopolitan directors, actors, producers, cinematographers, uh, financiers, cinema owners, and operators of this movement were involved in a cinematic praxis that increasingly aspired to be national, therefore creating a cosmo-national construct. Of course, the praising of this cinema as part and parcel of a national culture in the 1930s was in a way in constant denial of, this, of the industry's heterogeneity, since it is based on the principle of pre representation and repression of its cosmopolitan elements in a unifying nationalist discourse. After the 1930s, and I'm almost done, I promise, <laughs> As my book demonstrates, Iranian cinema continued this cosmopolitan tradition uh, in its filmmaking. In fact, the aspirations of film critics and cinema enthusiasts for the creation of a sustained sovereign cinema was fully actualized after a decade-long uh, hiatus in filmmaking, when cosmopolitan filmmakers began to produce popular films uh, again in 1948. So from the time of uh, the beginning of uh, World War II 
all the way to 1948. No feature films were produced. In my book, I trace the transformation of cosmopolitanism in the emergent national popular cinema of the 1940s and 1950s. While painting films with an Iranian color, this popular cinema drew on global mainstream film narratives, tropes, and characters, and engendered an entertaining cosmopolitan film enterprise, engaging with Hollywood, Indian, specifically Hindi, Egyptian, and Turkish popular cinemas from the 1950s to 1970s, these films face charges of West toxication or being uh, plagued by the West and imitation. Interestingly, critics such as Hoshan Kawusi coined the term film Farsi or Persian films for these films that emerged after World War II. For these popular productions, uh, and th this was a derogative, he was uh, using it in a derogative way, uh, and it was to draw attention to what he believed to be the single-sidedness of the, of the films. According to him, the only indicator of these films' Iranianness was the Persian language used in their dialogues. Other aspects of the films were believed to be imitations of international grade B and grade C films. So it's interesting how the Persian language, which was a, a signifier of nationalness <laughs> or, or um, the nation, basically, in 1930s, all of a sudden in 1950s becomes a derogative term um, uh, for, for these um, films. However, these films unraveled Iranian negotiations with rapid modernization and provided a social commentary on national changes from the 1950s to 1970s. In my book, I also trace cinematic cosmopolitanism in the new wave cinematic movement, uh, which solidified in 1960s, except that I consider it as an alternative movement and not necessarily a new wave cinema. This cinematic trend drew on and continued Iranian popular cinema's tradition of social criticism, but in a realist and artistically, artistically inclined cinematic form. The cinema, uh, which engaged with global cinematic trends such as Italian New Realism and French New Wave, and then later on Third uh, Cinema, now spoke to left-leaning international critics and gained attention from global film circuits. So I argue that the conditions facilitated through the cultural exchanges between local and global alternative movements set the condition for a cinematic revolution in, in Iran in the late 1950s in both content and form, which predated the political revolution of 1979. To sum up, aspirations for cinematic sovereignty the eventual emergence of a Persian language cinema and its pro propagation in Iran was very much enmeshed with the cosmopolitan society and co uh, culture of the region and could not be examined outside such paradigm. The institutionalization of cinema and aspirations for cinematic sovereignty in the 1920s and 1930s facilitated the formation of a Persian language cinema in Iran. Far from being a necessarily national cinema, the Persian language cinema of the 1930s was in fact a cosmo-national cinema. While the productions of this cinema relied heavily on a cosmopolitan cinematic culture, international funding, figures, and cinematic elements, the cultural offerings of the uh, industry were national as their content pertained to national or Indo-Persian history, heritage, myths, and heroes. One concern for the nationalist filmic narrative of this, of this time seems to have been the staging of Iran, not in an Orientalist depiction that had been widespread, but as a progressive country contemporaneous with its um, European and Western counterparts. While the international cinema made numerous attempts at picturing Iran and therefore constituting the, con the country as a zone of global political contestations, or a backward oriental land, Iran made efforts to display its na national heritage on the silver screen through the productions that it deemed as national or Iranian. More, most importantly, the national identity of these films was organized around their use of the Persian language. Their lower girl, Ferdowsi and Shirin Farhad, uh, some of the films I mentioned, were some of the talky productions of this era that boasted the usage of the language in their depiction of a glorious Persianate heritage or a changing and modern Iran. 
Interestingly, the Persian language, as I mentioned, became the signifying factor for a group of commercial films that were later on made in the 1950s all the way to 1970s, but now with a derogative connotation that deemed to separate them from the art house or alternative films of the period. Thank you very much for your attention. I try to be very brief. If uh, I might um, make a quick comment and then one question I have. The comment is that Khan Bahadur Ardashir Irani, if I might um, provide a bit of background, he is a Zoroastrian Indian, but he belongs to the Irani uh, group of migrants, so they have only been in India for one generation. So right. he actually. His father actually was. Uh, yeah. He, he actually Iran. speaks Persian, so he very much has this Iranian thing in him. Um, something that you, um, I actually have a little question and a big question. The little question is you translated the, uh, the, on the, on the posters that you showed at the very beginning, it was saying, giving the name of the man, which was Armenian, with Musyu. Mm -hmm. uh, but the woman was Khanum, was using the Iranian one. Um, Madame, I, Madame Golsaba. No, one of them the is actually saying just Khanum Golsaba in Persian. Uh, right, this is, and, so, so I wonder, I, in the, in the um, I think, I don't know why I put Madame Gulsaba, but there are other uh, versions of this, yeah, same no, no, advertisement that, no, I'm, not, I'm not, I'm not disputing your translation, I'm asking why, why one of them in uh, French, oh. why is Monsieur, but the woman is just Khanum, that's one question, the second question is probably, you are uh, looking at it, your, um, book that I haven't looked, so if you have time to. When does the image of ancient Iran, the images of ancient Iran, because you say the old Iran and the new Iran in Dukhtar al but that old Iran is Qajar Iran, the new Iran is Pahlavi. When does the image of that romantic images of Achaemenids and that sort of glory enters the movie making uh, industry? When do we have that coming in? Okay. Um... For in regard to this, I'm actually not sure, but there are many instances where you know they use titles interchangeably, uh, Khanum or Madam. I've seen many times they use Madam with Gol Saba because I have different versions of the same advertisement. Um, so I'm not sure, but I know that they actually use Madame or Monsieur because they're trying to uh, highlight the Europeanness of these artists, um, because uh, a lot of them being Armenian, of course they were famous for uh, you know, their theatrical spectacles um, and performances in Iran. So I believe that's one of the reasons they're, they're highlighting that, um, the, the hybrid uh, identities of a lot of these. Um, so when actually, what is interesting, a lot of times when they themselves uh, advertised uh, or wrote about themselves, they considered themselves as Iranian. Um, that's why I use the hybrid, uh, you know, Armenian-Iranian uh, identities. Uh, like uh, even um, Ohanians, for example, he always talked about my fellow national Iran uh, brothers and sisters, things like that. Um, the other question was, ah, uh, oh, right, right, right. Um, the images of ancient Iran actually had been circulating inside and outside Iran for some time, uh, beginning um, in the early 20th century when a lot of European filmmakers actually um, came to Iran. Actually, not from the early, early years, but from 1920s. Um, they traveled to Iran. They made, um, they recorded uh, like scenes from Persepolis but they also recorded scenes from uh, life in tribes, for example, um, in a very um, orientalist way uh, and ex exoticizing a, a little bit uh, these, the lives of these uh, people and also um, the ancient Persia as well. Um, but later on, uh, and some of these, uh, so of course none of this uh, appears in the 1930s because all these films were made in India. But later on in 1950s, you do have, late 1940s, early 1950s, you do have films that um, claim to be attending to the ancient history of Iran. Um, unfortunately, many of these films don't exist. We don't know exactly what's you know, included in the, in the scenes. 
but at least they, they claim to be attending to the ancient history of, of Iran. Um, but actually, you know what? Yeah, yeah, after World War II. And later on, uh, historical films were actually not very popular in Iran. In 1960s and 1970s, very few historical films were made. And I believe it was because very costly, it, it cost a lot, but there, there could be other reasons as well, yeah. I have a quick question. I'm more interested in the early period, 1900 to say 1925, and the role of how this fits into that period in the sense that we have the Armenian disaster, we have the Russian revolution in five and 17, we have revolts in beginning, a nationalist revolts in India and Southeast Asia, South Africa, and I'm, be, I'm wondering to what extent the new Russian post-17 people were training the actors and whether that was in the new Moscow theater tradition and the avant-garde films. I would like to hear a little bit more about the international political and cultural aspects during that period. Uh, that's actually a very interesting topic. <laughs> um, so. We don't have um, any sources that would directly tell us, you know, that there were um, Russians training Iranian filmmakers or even Armenian filmmakers at the time. But for example, with uh, with Ohanians, he studied in actually in, in Russia, filmmaking in Russia, in Moscow. And um, in his film, Haji Aga, actually you see uh, the Soviet montage, for example, in his film. So he, he is watching these other films and he is in a, his filmmaking is inspired by it in a way as well. Um, the Lore Girl, not so much, <laughs> but with, our, uh, with Ohanians, you definitely see it. Um, the, interestingly, the Soviets themselves were making films about Iran during this time. And it's, a, it's an article that I'm actually working on now. Uh, it's not in my book, but it will be coming out uh, as an article. Um, for, uh, in 1920s, they started making films about the history of Iran. They made films about the tobacco uh, movement in late 19th century, and then about the uh, Jangali movement, the forest uh, movement um, uh, of Mirza Kucharkhan Jangali. But in, of course, in a very biased, uh, biased manner. Um, I, does that answer your question to an extent? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so were the films shown in other places? Um, so the Lord Girl, I mean, uh, all the films that were made in India were shown in India as well. Um, another film such as uh, Ferdosi, for example, which was on the life of the poet, uh, Persian poet Ferdosi, um, was supposed to be distributed internationally. Um, to be honest with you, I've done I did the research in Russia and also in um, in um, in London. I haven't found. Uh, evidence, direct evidence that would tell me that the films were shown in these places. But they, um, I know that at the beginning, uh, at least according to the newspapers, um, they were supposed to send the films there. Now, I think the, films were, the film was not that good um, because um, Reza Shah actually saw the film and he asked the director to cut certain parts of it out. Um, so he had to shorten the film. And the shortened film apparently was not a very good film. So it's very likely that that film was not sent. Maybe to Russia it was sent, but not to other parts of the world. But during this time, uh, mostly in India, they were being shown. Um, in Turkey, I don't think they were being shown in Turkey. No, yeah. Thank you.